my beloved ones. Yes. You are precious. I call you beloved, not lightly, but with deep thought. You are beloved, worthy, resilient, resourceful, creative. And I embrace you in that spirit of our common heritage. We have been labeled in pejorative ways for so long. And there have not been voices to say, oh no, you are not ignorant, you're not heathens, you're not barbarians, you're not savage, as Agesis and Toybee and Hegel said. But you are a great and noble people. And it is my simplistic, inadequate effort to erase from your thinking the notion of being disadvantaged, deprived, at risk, endangered species. All of these pejorative labels that our children have had to live with and that the oppressor will provide funds for you to be able to give to the oppressor the right to use these labels against our children. So when I stand here as an elder, humble, an elder in the African tradition, that embraces the presence of the ancestors. We call them and they hear us. That recognizes our responsibility for the children. And that allows the elders to speak. So wherever you go, whatever you do, wherever you are, remember that an elder has told you that you are beloved, yes. that you are special, that you are unique, that you are extraordinary that your roots are deep, that you are worthy. And I embrace you with that knowledge of who you really, really are. I'm grateful, deeply grateful, to Dr. Malefe Asante and to the Institute for allowing me to come and spend some time with you. This is a conversation. I don't have any words or wisdom unless it comes to you as a reminder of what you already know. So may there be many opportunities to remind you of what you already know. The issue of education, an education that is liberating and enhancing and validating for African American children is one that we have not thought long and deeply enough about. So the topic is a blueprint for educating our children, fruit of our womb, in a tradition that will give them an understanding of who they are, why they live in a racist society, is one that I hope will be high on your agenda of thoughtfulness. It is not a mistake that any pathological index that's used to describe people of African ancestry, whether you're talking about prison, dropouts, poor housing, poor health, failure in education, all of those statistics that theoretically describe us, if you look at them deeply, you will see that they are what the oppressor has created in order for those words not to be definitions of who we are, but predictions mm -hmm. of what we will become. Mm -hmm. And it is not capricious that this has happened. From the time that we came to this country, not in the beginning when people who were voyagers and people who were adventurous came to what is called the New World. But when we were brought here as chattel slaves, we were denied any opportunity for an education. We were not allowed to read or write. My grandmother, who was an enslaved person in this country, and I knew her in my lifetime, and I am so grateful that I did know her, 
If you were found writing, your fingers were broken. If you were found reading, your tongue was mutilated. My grandmother said that she used to crawl under the teaster bed that old miss had for little miss. And my grandmother had to sleep on the floor beside this bed. But when the tutor came to teach little miss, my grandmother would roll under the bed and hide. And when the tutor left, she would go and get the book, try to find the place that he had used for his lessons so that she could teach herself. And when we today say that our children have difficulty learning, <laughs> you can teach yourself if you have the desire and the love and the understanding. And we know that the punishment was severe. And then after slavery theoretically ended, there was a conference, the Mohawk Conference, 1876. And it's Ray Wishburn at Morgan State who has done much of the research about this conference. And the conference was to determine what are you going to do about the education of children of African ancestry who were now theoretically free. And they made some decisions about what would be the bulwarks, what would be the foundational relationship between these children and education. And they said, first, teach the teachers how not to teach black history. Never let the former enslaved person connect with the continent of Africa. Third, never let them control their schools. 1876. Along came Arthur Schlesinger Jr. in the 80s. And he edited a book called The Disuniting of America. It was financed by Federal Express. And this came just after our concern with the development of a curriculum of inclusion. Now the curriculum of inclusion was unique in that never in the history of the Board of Regents had there been any writing about African American children that wasn't done by European people. So when I became a member of the Board of Regents in 1986, I said we need to look at the reason why four groups of children are failing in the state schools. African American children, Native American, Latino children, and third generation Asian children. Why are they failing? Why is this group persistently failing? Now, the Board of Regents had never looked at that. They had looked at issues about which they could do nothing, such as funding, such as the distribution of teachers, because the distribution of teachers was determined by the union and funding was determined by the state. <laughs> budget office, not the state Board of Regents. The Board of Regents <laughs> had no budget. <laughs> We would make pronouncements like all children could learn, but we couldn't finance it because the money had to be voted in. So I said, well, why do we spend all of our time talking about those things that we cannot control when we control curriculum? The state tests are based on the state curriculum. What is it that we control? Curriculum. So let's look at curriculum. Well, you would be surprised how long it took even to get the Board of Regents to decide to look at curriculum. They knew what curriculum said, and it said what they wanted it to say, mm -hmm. that they were superior, That's right. that they had the fine art, right. that they had the classical music, right. that they had all of the fairy tales, the European fairy tales, so they had no reason to want to look at curriculum. <laughs> Their children were not failing. But it took persistence and strategizing to get them to agree. Then the decision was each ethnic group that is failing 
must have the research done by someone from their ethnic group. It was like a revolution. They said, you mean you're going to have an African-American look at the curriculum to see how it affects African-American children? I said, yes, because an African-American is the only one that can do that evaluation. That was another struggle. But we finally were able to get scholars from the specific ethnic group where the children were failing to do the research. They never met together, but they got the curriculum from pre-kindergarten through secondary school, and they agreed unanimously. The curriculum as it exists is divisive, it is distortive, it marginalizes the children, and it has a direct impact on their school success. That's what the curriculum of inclusion said. All of the years when research had been done around failure, they never had an integrated diverse group. They also never had another group of people to come in and review what the findings were, but they did this time. And one of the people was Diane Ravage. Mm. Diane Ravage led the fight to say, not that the findings were not true, but that they were harsh. And the words were damning. Well, they were, but they were true. <laughs> so what happened? Arthur Schlesinger Jr. was commissioned to try to take the heart out of this piece. Now, in his book, The Disuniting of America, he only talked about the African-American piece. All of the African-American scholars, Dr. Jeffries, A. <laughs> David, Wade, no, all of these people were included in this book. Now, what happened then? Even people of African ancestry said, well, did you think that they were going to accept something just about African-American children? I said, the curriculum of inclusion is not just about African-American children. But to show you what media can do and the power of the oppressor. So that piece was never voted on. But Arthur Schlesinger Jr.'s book went all over the United States. And it really was saying to funders, don't give these people any money. Because if these children really connect Go back to the Mohawk Conference. If they really connect with the continent of Africa, if they really learn about who they are, if the teachers really do teach history, this will be a threat. Not so long after that, Albert Shanker Jr., the head of the American Federation of Teachers, said in a presentation before a group of legislators African-American children must not learn their history and culture. Because if they do, they will relate to their ethnicity rather than become American. Now, not only did he say it, but as the head of the American Federation of Teachers, he had the power to enforce it. So when we look at the issues of education, it is not simplistic. It is not something that happened. It has been crafted, chronicled, strategized, and is operational today, just as it was in 1876 when Rutherford Hayes was president and the Mohawk Conference took place. I hope that you remember that when Mr. Bennett was Secretary of Education, the statement that he made oh, yeah. about how to deal with crime and violence he said, abort African-American children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These were his words as Secretary of Education. So when we talk about a blueprint for the education of children of African ancestry in a racist society, it is an enormously important issue because education is the essence of what it takes to keep a people broken. If you can keep them from learning about themselves, learning the nobility of their history, 
learning the greatness of their first parent people and tell the world we are the parent people. Mm -hmm. First word, mm -hmm. first science, first medicine, mm -hmm. first theology, mm -hmm. first one God worship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And on the tombs and temples in Egypt and Aswan, our people left the story of their greatness. Yes. And that's why we must go there yes. and see it. They were wise enough to write it for us. So it is available to us today. Now as a parent, as a grandparent, as a surrogate parent, because in the African consciousness, we are responsible for the children. Children born of our bodies, born of your bodies, born of your bodies, born of your seed, they are all our children. That is our responsibility. And so we have to think about what are we going to do knowing that education is the weapon of oppression. All this talk about middle class people and now the unemployment rate is down. What about the issue of not just middle class people? What about the issue of a higher minimum wage so that people do not have to stay in poverty? What about the restraints in terms of job opportunities? What about the notion of our children not getting into the brightest classes? What about the issue of taking music and art out of the school system? So the issues that I have raised so far are national issues. From the Mohawk Conference, Arthur Schlesinger Jr., Albert Shanker, these are national issues. But education is a state's rights issue. That's right. And one of the reasons why we have not been successful as much as we would like to be is that we don't understand that it is a state's rights issue. That's why in the South, after Brown versus the Topeka Board of Education, the Europeans closed the schools. It didn't matter That's that right. the United States had said there had to be integration because education is a state's rights mm -hmm. issue. So if you are in a state and you do not know how that state operationalizes education, there's very little chance that you will be able to do anything about the substance of where the problems of education That's come right. from. That's right. And it's fascinating to me that there is a gentleman, uh, William Barber, you may have heard of him, with Moral Monday. He's the head of the NAACP in one of the southern states. And he is also the minister of the church. And he looked at the issues that were of concern in that area where he lived and looked to the state to see what the state had said and was responsible for. Now, when I became a regent in 1986, I followed Kenneth Clark. Mm -hmm. Kenneth Clark was not the first African-American regent. There had been two others before him but they represented upstate areas. And he lived downstate, even though he was a regent at large. And I took his place. And I began to go all over the state because I was at large. Our people didn't know anything about state. They didn't know about the Board of Regents, that we were responsible for all education from pre-kindergarten through postdoctoral studies, libraries, museums, education in the prisons public television, public radio, and we license and regulate 52 professions. Mm -hmm. Now, of those 52 professions, if you as a consumer of the services of that professional feel that you have not been treated properly, the landscape gardener put the bush in the wrong place, the internal design was off kilter, you can raise an issue free of charge and the Board of Regents will investigate and they can send that person back to school, they can take away their license, uh, they can find them. Education is not one of those professions. <laughs> so that if your child never had a certified teacher, or a teacher certified in the subject that they're teaching, if they don't have a lab in their school, if they were on a half day, you have no adjudicative process. Now, that can you imagine that people didn't understand that if you don't have knowledge of your rights, then you can't access them. So the job of being a regent, unpaid, no staff, no driver, no office, 
<laughs> Very wealthy people on the Board of Regents, and my husband and I had to decide whether this was really something that I could do. Because when I became a Regent of New York State, I could not work in New York State. I could not be a consultant, I could not be a speaker for pay, so it meant that I, redu I lost my salary. Mm. But the issue was, are we willing to make it with what we had, mm. so that for at least two years, I would stay there and try to make our people aware mm. of what the issues of education were, why the curriculum was not integrated, why there weren't teachers of African ancestry, why there were schools on a half day, why there were outdated textbooks. I stayed 21 years because the issues were so great. And interestingly enough, work that we did, curriculum of inclusion, it was never voted upon because the community that had the power knew what would happen. So it was just set aside, never voted upon. But it, in some instances, empowered our people. Leonard Jeffries lost his job, had a major court case. I was called during the trial. As Dr. Asante told you that he went. And then there was the campaign for fiscal equity. That was a campaign to show that New York City was underfunded in education far below the rest of the state. Pataki spent $11 million fighting that, but we won. Now when it was won, the superintendents from upstate, remember, education is a state's issue, said, well, we're not giving up any of our money. So until today, $2 billion is owed to New York City for the historic underfunding of education in New York City, particularly as it affects children of African ancestry. But our people are not able to understand the implications. So when we talk about a blueprint, first in the blueprint, you've got to prepare yourself to understand the nature of the struggle. And that's why I outlined the parameters of how we are in the situation that we're in. So you'll understand the nature of the problem. And prepare yourself. We've got nothing in terms of voting, public accommodations, public eating places until we marched, demonstrated, protest, got beaten, some died. And we're not going to get what we want in education until the nature of the sacrifice meets the common people. Mm. The nature of the sacrifice meets the common people. So you have to prepare yourself if you're sincere about a blueprint. Next thing, you have to buy yourself, your persona, your bearing, your attitude, show that you value yourself. That is Dr. Malefi Asante says that you are the subject, not the object. Right. You are the subject of your existence. Right. That you are empowered and empowering. Right. And then you have to decide to have a child. That the European system talks a lot about parent education. Now, I don't think Noah built the ark while the flood was raging. <laughs> I think he had to build it before that. Jeez. And I submit that we have unique issues that pertain to us. We need pre-parenting so that before the child comes to this world, there is a readiness on the part of the parent to deal with a blueprint. Rather than, well, the child is here and come up like a weed and I'll go there and put him in school. I don't know anything about the teacher. I haven't met the teacher. But, and they think that it's all right. There's nobody in there that's planning for the success of your child. Yeah. They are planning to keep their power and control and dominance. And the struggle to change that is a sacrificial struggle. And it's a struggle that we must do together. Now, after you get that part straight, then here comes this child. Don't get caught up 
in not understanding some of the behaviors uh, that we used for survival and those behaviors that are no longer relevant. Now, for example, uh, during slavery, a mother who had a very bright youngster, if you ask, well, how's he doing? Oh, you know, he fair to middling, you know, he's, he's not too bright. That was because if the slave master saw that you had a very bright, precocious child, that child's going to be taken away. Mm -hmm. So a survival technique was to not admit that you had a very bright child. I have had so many instances of parents who do not tell their children that they are brilliant, that they are worthy, that they are capable, because they don't even know why they don't do it. But it is a residue. And it's also very difficult for the child. Uh, I had a conversation with a parent who said that uh, she was talking to a European parent, and I have never met a European whose children weren't geniuses. That's right. <laughs> never met one. And they're going to tell you how That's bright they exactly are and how skilled right. they are. Right. And uh, she said that she was having a conversation uh, with this parent, and a uh, European parent, and the parent was talking about how bright her child was. And then the African-American parent, in talking about, oh, you know, he's, he's getting along. And the child overheard the conversation. She wanted, and he wanted to ask the parent, well, why, why did you say that? I'm doing better than he is. Right. But because of the way we had been taught in slavery, you don't ask questions to your parents, you don't talk about Realize also that that's something that was used as a survival device. It is no longer valid. It no longer work with your child. The boy wanted to ask his mom, why, why are you doing that? Why, why are you saying? It made him feel bad. Children have feelings. My grandmother said that on the plantation where she Lynn, even though you were separated from language groups on purpose so that you would not be able to communicate, that whenever a little black child was around, you know, they, whenever they could, they would embrace them. They would validate them. They would touch them with affection. But if Ole Miss happened in at that time, get on away from me I'm in my way. Get on away. Can't you see I'm busy? Now, if you didn't get a chance to go back and explain to that child because of the language difference and because of your inability to be sure that you could articulate, this child would wonder, well, what is this? One minute I'm embraced, the next minute I'm pushed away. We still do that. Because it was a survival technique, but it is no longer valid. We must tell our children that they are beautiful that they are brilliant, that they are capable. We must embrace and validate them. Don't think that your child's worth depends upon his reading score. That's right. That's right. 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 something that he does, he's not interested in. Right. Don't think that y'all can't tell all the nursery rhymes that are violent in terms of European nursery rhymes, whether you're talking about rockabye baby in the treetop, what happens? Yeah. Says, is that good? Yeah. still skins and his daughter up in the tower to spin gold mm -hmm. and stay up there till you come down. You can't come down until you do that. And what about little Red Riding Hood? There's stories of violence, every single one. What about the stories of courage and dignity and power and character? Now, when I try to introduce in my school African. Proverbs, proverbs that I had been taught by mother, my mother and grandmother, and stories that came from Tanzania and from African countries that now are available to us. Do you know what the parents said to me? Are those stories true? Do you think we should tell them that? That they had been so brainwashed. And I said to them, do you think that little Bo Peep is true? Do you think the three men, you think it's true? But it was because she had been so brainwashed. 
to believe that whatever the man said, his right. sugar is sweeter, his salt is saltier. Yes. And if that's what he says, that's the right thing, and that's what I want my child to learn because they going to compete. That's the very reason why many children don't read. And I'll tell you the best lesson that I ever had in education was in 1950. I started teaching in Bedford Stuyvesant. I had a bachelor's degree from Brooklyn College. I had a master's degree from Wellesley College. I had a University of the Sun degree from my parents. <laughs> that helped me to know who I was. My mother was ill, and I had to work. And so when I went to this school in Bedford Stuyvesant, I was assigned to an opportunity class. It wasn't an opportunity. It's a class made up of 14 boys. They were not retarded. They had a class for CRMD. These boys were not retarded, but they were called opportunity class because they were recalcitrant and difficult and they ran up and down the halls and bothered the teachers and the other children. So the principal told me, Mr. Feinstein, he says, all you have to do, Ms. Hines, is just keep them in the class. Just keep them in the room and keep them from bothering them. That's all I was <laughs> Well, of course, I was going to teach these children. And so I began with the books that were there, Ted and Sally, oh, and uh, they had uh, what they call workbooks with little white children in them. And there was one young man, mm -hmm. David Rosena. Thank God for David. Mm -hmm. He was the chairman of the board. <laughs> <laughs> they called him the gang leader, but he was chairman of the board. <laughs> Brilliant chief person. Mm -hmm. So he said, uh, Miss Hines, I'm going to tell you why we don't read that book. We don't like that book. Because I had been asking them. I said, I know you can read. What, what is the problem? Why are you in this class? He said, we don't want that book. I said, all right, what, what book do you want? We want Pussy and Dick. I said, oh, well, let me see what I can do. <laughs> so I made an appointment with Mr. Pussy, my naive friend. And, uh, oh, he said, Miss Hines, I, I'm so pleased, you know, the children aren't running in the hall. I said, but they're not, they're not reading. He said, well, you know, we don't, it's okay, we don't expect that. I said, no, they can read, but they want a different book. They don't like the book. They don't like Ted and Sally. I want to see if there's, are there any other books? He says, well, what do you mean they don't like the book? I said, they want Pussy and Dick. <laughs> he closed the door. He said, let me get the guidance counselor. <laughs> so he explained to me that that was not a book. They were talking about the sex information that they wanted. <laughs> the next day when I got to the class, I said, what did you do to me? What do you mean, Miss Hines? I said, do you know you almost got me fired? You had, what? what? Why would anybody fire you? You're working hard. You come every day on time. You like us. I said, they're firing me because I told them that you wanted pussy and dick. Oh, Miss Hines, we knew you were dumb, but we didn't know you were dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, I'm going to make an arrangement with you. First thing, we've got to have the same vocabulary. If you want to know about penis and vagina, that's not a problem. Because you all have that, and we can talk about that and its function and its sacredness and when it's appropriate for you to use it and when not. I said, that's not a problem. We just have to have the same vocabulary. But you can't have me going out in the world acting like I don't know what's you do it. Now you tell me what you want. What do you really want? And this is what David told me. He said, I want to read about myself. Uh -oh. mm -hmm. I want to read about me. I want to read about opening a can without a can opener. Uh -oh. uh -oh. I want to read about roaches that come out at night. Mm -hmm. I want to read about having to go up a staircase when there are no stairs. Mm -hmm. I ain't got no damn white fence, mm -hmm. no door, and no daddy. <laughs> so I don't want to read that crap. Mm -hmm. I was so thankful to take it. Mm -hmm. That was the best lesson. I want to read about me. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm absolutely in favor. You tell me your story. I will put it on an experience chart. 
I used all of find the words that rhyme, find the smaller words, make fit in a sentence. Whatever they told me, it was their story. Didn't matter if it was a curse word. I tried to substitute another word. I said, well, here's another word that you can use just in case you want somebody else to read this. And they may not know what you're talking about if you use that word. And today, the same thing is true. Our children want to know about themselves. Now, if the school isn't supplying it, there are two things you have to do. You must supplement it. And at the same time, you must fight on the level to get the curriculum included. You have to know how the system works in your state. I am aware of the fact that recently, Governor Corbett signed legislation for the Holocaust mm -hmm. to be taught in all the schools of Pennsylvania. In Philadelphia, they have the year's work. But the whole state, one piece of, of the curriculum, just the Holocaust, not the whole story of the Jews, not the whole story of the Irish family, just the part that promotes the sympathy and the gifts for them. We're talking about pre-colonization of Africa. We're talking about the brilliance of our people. The first people, first word, first sight. We're talking about the theft, the stolen legacies. That's what we want. And it can happen. But it's not going to happen because there's somebody planning to do the right thing for your children. Next thing you have to do is support community-based organizations that validate you. When you come in here, don't you feel validated? Don't you feel the warmth of the Don't you feel the wisdom of the ancestors all around you? Don't you feel the camaraderie of a struggling people and the faith of a struggling people? Dr. Asante is a public intellectual. Now, he could stay right there at Temple, he didn't have to have this institute here among the people so that they could hear the scholars and the resources and see the books that they wouldn't see if they're not in academia. We need public intellectuals who will establish places that we own where we can teach our people. And then we have to help our children to understand the nature of the oppressor and his very subtle ways of working and the people that he puts in power. It's not easy, but it's possible. It's possible to do both things. My mother was a genius, and she taught us as much as she knew in terms of history, but she also taught us how to manipulate and survive in terms of passing tests and so forth. And we did the same thing at 21. The tests were not a problem. We said, look, we got to learn this stuff. It isn't necessarily true. But when we finish learning it, we're going to hit the road. We're going to go to the circus. We're going to go to every place that we want to go to get them to understand. It's a chess game. This is what you have to do. And so my mother said, look, when the teacher gives the test about Columbus, we knew Columbus didn't discover America. She said, you put on the paper, the teacher said, Columbus discovered America. <laughs> teacher can't fail you. Doesn't compromise your integrity. That's right. But you've got to give your children some weapons. You've got to make it possible for them to survive this system so that they don't drop out. You have to be the surrogate. My mother would tell us, tell the teacher, you can't sass her, but my mother will come. <laughs> Who are the advocates that will go to school for our children? Get them out of those special ed classes. They're not special ed children. They're children that the young European princess-like white teacher either seduces them and if she can't do that I mean by that she lets her carry her pocketbook and sit close to her I don't mean in a sexual sense but I mean seduce him into thinking it is so wonderful to be near her and when the High Horizons program came uh, into New York that's one of the things that they did in order to make our children cultured they were culturally deprived and so at the High Horizons program and we took the children to the Brooklyn Museum, and uh, they would come back and talk about what they had seen. That was supposed to be giving them culture. I was selected to be a High Horizons teacher, and my colleague and I noticed that when the children came back, they were talking about 
the European things that they had seen. And the white teachers in the lunchroom were groaning over it. Oh, you know, he said, I like the way you look, Miss Bloomfield. I didn't like that other picture. They were making a joke of it. So my friend and I said, look, we got to find out what it is that they see. Because we weren't assigned to go. We were supposed to just get the buses and so forth, which is another thing. You can't just do your job description. You got to do everything that's necessary. <laughs> Under the table, over the table, on the table, and anywhere you can. So we went over to the museum to see what is it. So when you came, went into the museum, you entered a space like this. One side, there were absolutely incredible African masks but they weren't labeled. So they looked grotesque to the children because they didn't know what it was that they were seeing. On the other side, here were these European women lounging on chase lounges, beautifully retired, hair flowing. And so the children wanted to identify with that. So we said, okay, the two of us, we were going to take a group of children, prepare them for what they were going to see, and then do an assembly program. So we taught them the meaning of these masks, fertility masks, a mask of victory, the use of beads, use of methods of all different kinds, the words that were coming out of the mouth, the various meanings of these statues and masks, which were not labeled. On the other side, there were these women, and we told them, they are courtesans. They are women waiting to please the lust of the men of the court. So we did the assembly program, and the children were magnificent. You see those nails? That means he won the victory. You see those beads? That means she's an important person. And they went through the whole thing that they had been taught. And those are my ancestors. And those people over there, they're quarters of. That means whole. <laughs> Uh, so that they can understand. So we have to teach her to take them to the music, but help them to understand what they see and what it means. And tell your children that they are beloved. And that there were all kinds of efforts made to suppress their brilliance, but they are still brilliant. And I wrote this little piece for a little girl that I met in Rochester, New York. She came over to speak to me. Her grandmother said, my granddaughter wants to talk to you because she saw your picture and she knew that you were going to be here speaking. I said, oh, I'd be delighted to speak to her. And the child came over and she was so beautiful. Big liquid eyes, her skin was like velvet. And the only thing that was wrong, her hair was processed. But she was beautiful. And so I said to her, oh, I'm so happy to meet you. You are so beautiful. She said, but I'm black. I said to the grandmother, have you never told her that she was beautiful? Mm -hmm. My very close friend from Samota, her great niece, went to a program about three months ago. And the program was about making little girls dress up like princesses. And so her little niece, who has her hair in cornrows, was there, and she had on her little princess outfit. And these little white girls came over to her and said, you can't be a princess. Look at your hair. Oh, Three months ago. So you see where we still are. Mm -hmm. So I wrote this for the children. And I won't read all of it. I'll just read a part of it. To my beloved ones, when the ancient sages of Timbuktu, Mali, Songhai, and the Nile River cultures flourished with dignity and purpose, they must have known the enormous measures that would be taken to erase their sagacity, to eradicate their massive intelligence. Colonization, theft, chattel slavery, Jim Crow, all of these lynchings, sterilizations, rape, emotional and psychological attempts at cultural strangulation were attempt to obliterate your greatness. Don't be deceived, confused, and misdirected away from your nobility and your beauty and your natural gifts 
You are beloved, worthy, and treasured. The world cannot survive without the natural resources of the parent continent and the human resources of its people. The miracle of our survival is expressed in and depends upon the confluence of irrefutable information about how and who you are. Our ancestors left the evidence. The whole story, the rapture of valid living of which schooling is only a part, not the whole. The whole is the insistent cry of a liberated people, bellowing words of comfort and confidence to you and in you and yours. My beloved ones, lift your voice and mine. May it never be hushed. It may be quieted, but never. Still. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.